I see all these people flipping out about these cartoon apes. And I'm like, what? What are these apes? Like, what is going on? One of the best things that NFTs have brought to the table is they have made the collecting so accessible to people. All my early collectors are OGs in my mind. But for me, art is like a need. It's not a want. And collecting is just another form of that. I clicked really fast on the people drop and I actually managed to get it for $1. If I've collected your work, I'm holding it with diamond hands. If you're collecting something, it could become hot in two minutes or 200 years. Welcome to the Collector's Call with Particle, where we chat about art with the top collectors and creators in Web3. I'm your host, Scooter, and today our guest is Beverly Kills, an artist who creates subversive and striking images that question many of the values and behaviors we take for granted in society. If you enjoy this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Beverly Kills. Beverly Kills, welcome to the Collector's Call. Hi there. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, we're so grateful that you could join us. Um, let's dive in a little bit with your background before we turn to some of your uh, specific artworks. You're from West London, an area renowned for street art. What influence did growing up in that place have on you? Oh, it had a, a, a great influence. Um, so, you know, the area is known for street art. There was a uh, famous football pitch, which you guys, I think, will call a soccer field. And um, it was called um, the, 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 the Holy Grail. So street artists from all around the world, uh, they used to come and um, do a lot of graffiti and street art um, in, in this football pitch. And I just grew up around it, you know, just looking everywhere I looked. Uh, there was some sort of, you know, fantastic street artist putting something up on a wall somewhere. That sounds like an amazing milieu to to grow up in. When when did you start creating art and what inspired you to begin? Okay, so um when I say street art, I I'm mostly talking about like graffiti. That's what we saw mostly in the streets. Um and so one day I went to my brother's house, he just moved into a new home. And um when I walked in, there was um just these pieces of art on the wall and I never knew I never knew what they were. They were Banksy's. So he 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 luckily collected a ton of Banksy's in the early 2000s before the market took off. And um, actually, you're like the story, actually, funny enough, because, yeah. Um, so I've walked into the house and I've looked at these things and I'm like, this looks like street art. This looks like something that I see outside. But um, I was only eight years old, nine years old, maybe 10 at most. So I never understood the context within the art, if that makes sense, because I was too young. But I knew I liked it because it resembled something that I, uh, um, I, I'm I, used to. And um, he said to me, if you like the art that much, why don't you try and create your own? I'll get you some tools, you know. And I said to him, OK, I didn't know what he meant by tools. I didn't know what a stencil was. I didn't know how these pieces of art were put together. I had no clue. Um, so we went to the art shop in High Street, Kensington, and um, he bought me all the tools. And he said, now create some art. And I said to him, okay, cool. So um, he bought me some books as well on stencil art. So I was reading, learning, and just trying to soak up as much as I can, failing, cutting my fingers. Oh, mate, it was it was terrible. But I ended up getting my head around it somehow. And then, um, and then as I grew older, maybe 14, 15, 16, I remember I was sitting down at the... Um, I was sitting down in his house having breakfast at the the breakfast table and I looked at the Banksy and I said, hang on a second, I kind of understand this message. I understand this context behind this. And I said to my brother, is there like a message within this art? He said, of course there is. Um, but I was waiting for you to mature before, you know, going into that, delving into that topic. And then I, and then something just clicked. I was like, so this is street art, but with a message this is something deeper this is something where people can connect to it no matter who they are where they're from rich or poor black or white anything and i was like right this 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 seems interesting because now this creates a challenge and um from that point on i never looked back i just i went insane about it to be honest with you and um that, that yeah that's how that came around it's fascinating to hear about. We speak with some 
individuals who are obviously raised around art, but I've never heard anyone raised uh, around Banksy's art. That's uh, certainly an early phase to have been collecting in the in the early 2000s. And, and we'll definitely want to touch on that when we come to some questions on collecting a little bit later. Uh, I understand you took on the role of a, a full-time artist somewhat unexpectedly. Can you tell us how you came to, to work full-time in the creative field? Of course. Um, so as we all know, you know, life gets ahead of you. You get bills, um, you know, rent, mortgage, car bills, you know, life gets ahead of you. So, you know, you end up getting a job and society just, you know, you end up in the, the hamster wheel, you know, the rat race, you know, just working. And, um, you know, the, the, the art life kind of just, you know, fell behind, kind of forgot about it, sadly. And, um, you know, I was just looking for like a career change and I ended up enrolling into the Royal Marines, uh, which is uh, equivalent to uh, SEAL Team 3. And um, I was going through the training, you know, doing my best. And all of a sudden, uh, I woke up at about four o'clock in the morning and I had the worst uh, temperature, stomach aches. And um, I tried to ignore it. But as the week went by, I, I, I couldn't even swallow a bean or a chip. I couldn't swallow anything. And uh, they, they said to me, listen, you've lost about five, six kilos in the past 10 days. You, you, you need to go to the hospital. Went to the hospital and I found out, um, I went to the hospital, borderline anemic. And um, they said to me, listen, you've got Crohn's and colitis. And um, I said, what's Crohn's and colitis? I never heard about it before. And um, they said to me, it's a serious disease. You need to take it seriously. And I said, all right, cool. Um, so how long until I can get back into the training? They were like, you can't. I don't think you understand. You can't go into the Royal Marines now. And um, so I was like, all right, how long until I'm at the hospital? They were like, you're going to be here for about two weeks until you recover. So, you know, severe depression hit me. Um, my whole career, the whole path that I had um, lined up for myself, just gone, you know. And uh, my brother came to see me and um, he said to me, you're right. I said to him, nah, I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. You know, it sucks right now. And he said to me, well, you know what you can do? I said to him, what? He said, you can draw. And I said to him, listen, I'm not in the mood for, for, for this right now, bro. And he said to me, listen, I'm going to go buy you an iPad. Um, maybe there's something you want to look into. It's called digital art. It's called NFTs. And I said to him, all right, cool, whatever. You know, I just went him out my room. And he went and God bless this guy, man. He's, you know, it's been a big part of my life. He went and bought me an iPad. And uh, with a pen and all the et ceteras, he came back and he said, uh, do what you do best, you know, draw. So for the rest of the time I was in hospital, I was just making art and um, doing, delving into NFTs. And um, by the time three days went by, I realized, you know what, you know what, everything happens for a reason. This is, this, this is what I want to do. This is, um, I'm going to give this a good go. And then when I came out, I just, you know, I just, I, I gave it my all, basically. I gave it all. I, I had nothing to give but but art, um, and 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 that's what happened. To be honest with you, that's the honest truth. It, it's easy to see in hindsight that that your transition into art has been quite successful, and and we're all grateful for for that move. But um, I can hear in your voice that must have been a, a difficult experience and a, a challenging scenario to to pass through at the time. Yeah, I would admit. I would admit it was. It was. Um, yeah, I mean, the disease itself is actually, you know, um, it's a gene, you know, so it's it, it's a gene that attacks your own immune system. And um, maybe about six months ago, it spreaded now to my spine. So it hasn't gotten any better. Um, you know, I'm not very, you know, agile anymore. And, you know, it's, it's, it's eating away at, at me. But, you know, for as long as I'm here, I'll always bring positivity and I'll always bring... Um, the best art that I can bring to the table and the, the best version of myself, you know, and, and that's all that matters to me, to be honest. Well, thank you for, for sharing that uh, personal insight into your own background and we'll be rooting for you, uh, both for your art and, and personally um, moving forward. You mentioned your, your, uh, your brother uh, a couple of times already. It sounds like he's had quite a, a significant impact on your connection with art. Can you, can you share a little bit of your thoughts on that? Of course. Um, yeah, you're definitely right about that. Um, like I said, he, 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 he collected a lot of um, street art, 
from the early days. So, um, you know, of course, Banksy's the biggest street art name. We all know that, but he's not the only, you know, there's there's plenty of guys that were doing the type of art that he's doing before he came along. And they don't get a lot of recognition, but um, I would definitely advise a lot of people to go out there and just go on Pinterest and type in street art, you know, and, and the, the artists that are all around the world, Spain, Italy, all the way up to Morocco, to America, all around the world, they do fantastic stuff. And he he just put me onto all of them. And he 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 would he had so much art that he couldn't hang them all on the walls. So he had like a room where they'll all be um in, in folders and filed. And um he'd sh- sh- you know he'd take one out and he'll explain to me, you know, back in so and so um this street artist made this piece because it was based on a political move political move made by this person and he'll give me the whole breakdown of of of, of the artist's thought process in, in, in the creation process of making the piece so not only did he say oh that's what that means he gave me the breakdown and the whole creation process of of, of the artist and I felt like I began to understand and know these people personally and um so when it came to like being an artist myself, I kind of understood the the steps and 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 the process because it's easy to make a stencil. It, it, let's be honest, it's easy to make a stencil. Uh, my 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 art is not very complicated. It's not the creation process. It's the thought process that's that's complicated. It's the thought process that got, that that takes sometimes weeks. Because, yeah, you, you might want to touch on a point, but how are you going to touch on that point? Because with Beverly Kills and with street art, it's whoever does it in the most simplistic way is, is the one that achieves the, 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 the best um, piece, if that makes sense. Because, you, you know, you don't want too much going on because you haven't got that much time, if that makes sense. When you're making street art, you're not going to be there for six, seven hours making a piece of art on the wall. you got to go put a stencil on the wall spray it leave so how do you get that message across so quickly where someone looks at it and it's just like bang i understand what they've done there that's the hard part it's the thought process that goes on behind it and um that's what i learned you know over time and that's what i, f- I believe i've become uh good at over time i think that's my speciality is the simplicity of a beverly kills your your art definitely conveys a, an immediate message to it. Let's dive into some of that thought process. Your your bio on Twitter states that art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. How does that message inform the artwork that you create? I mean, I just I just to be honest with you, I love that quote. Like, I'm not going to be the person that sits here and saying, you know, give you a story behind everything. I just love that quote. I feel like it should do that. You know, if you if you if you're too comfortable in your life and you feel like if you're too comfortable, then that's not a good thing because, you know, like outside of your comfort zone is where life is worth living. Um, so, yeah, it should comfort the the, the, the disturbed and disturb the comfort, comfortable. Because for me, for example, if I see a bank scene in the street and it's, um, I don't know, um, something political and I just look at it and it makes me laugh because it makes me think, you know what, someone else gets it. And that's me being comforted. Um you know, striking an emotion within me. And it just, I don't know, it just feels like a perfect quote, if that makes sense. It just, it fits right in with um, what I believe and what I do, if that makes sense. And and everybody that that's listening, like some of my collectors and my friends on here, they're exactly the same. Everyone's got a bit of a loose screw in that, you know, that we all kind of bond with. Do you know what I mean? Like when none of us are perfect and we don't try to admit to be perfect. Um and and I think that's what we all love about each other, man. I do like that idea. There, there's two parts of that sentence. Uh, I think it's in, initially quite vivid that you're disturbing some of the comfortable in society with your themes. But but then I started to take to heart the idea that maybe this is also comforting people who aren't uh, part of whatever we might consider the mainstream, who have those viewpoints that really resonate yeah. with your artwork. And that's an interesting thought on its own. Yeah, because you're not lonely. You know, you're not the only one, you know, like I get, I get it. I know what it's like. Do you know what I mean? Like you might see one of my, you might see something and you're like, where it touches on, you know, a bit of poverty, a bit of this, a bit of that, that type of art piece. And it's like, oh, he gets it. Yeah. Cause you're not the only one. So it should comfort you. And then the person who's, you know, lived with a silver spoon all their lives might see that piece and think, oh, I don't want to know about poverty in London. Well, 
yeah, there you go. You should feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Absolutely. Your your art offers a strong critique of uh, quite a few different themes. One is um, social media through pieces like Digital Love, uh, Balloon, and Will You Follow Me? What concerns do you want to highlight related to our experience with social media? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a topic to delve into. I mean, we all know that it's, it's, it's become just, I don't know, like a, a, another limb. Uh, social media is just so impactful on our lives that we don't even know the we, we we have to differentiate between what's real and what's not. Like, you know, a, who a person is on social media might not be who they are in real life. And, you know, how people perceive us on social media affects how we perceive ourselves. How unbelievable is that? How powerful is that of a machine? That if people don't feel like I'm, I'm living a happy, great life on social media, then I'm not going to be living one in real life too but if everyone feels like i'm doing really well and i'm successful on social media then i'm fooling everyone but who are you really fooling who are you it's become it's become a machine that we, we've lost control of you know social media is good if you know how to control it if you know how to use it to your advantage and your benefit but it's become just such a big part of our um, per, um our personalities and who we are and i don't feel like those two things should have anything to do with each other and you know it's i feel sorry for the the, the generation coming up because you know the parents now have such a task on their hands that it's 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 a losing war it's a losing battle and yeah it's a shame to see to be honest it's, i think one of the darkest things that have you know come about in our time is the power of social media and what it does to the to the youth. The pieces you've created do a, a great job of encapsulating that message, and I think it's a lot more. Uh, it probably resonates with people more than more than a short essay might. So thank you for creating those works. Um, I've pinned digital love here, and and a common theme throughout all of your works is the that defining pink background. You've mentioned that pink challenges you as an artist. Why did you choose it as the mm. the main uh, theme or color theme running through your works, and and how does that choice influence the meaning of your art? Um, I I love the color, so uh, I just that's that's the first thing. I love that color, and um, the second thing is uh, when I was making my first piece, um, not my first piece, but one of my pieces back in the day, um, my brother said, "You know what? That is a really nice color, and um, I reckon you should." Keep, keep that as your theme and I said to him why and he said to me um because it, it it makes you stand out you know as soon as someone sees that they're gonna think Beverly Kills and I said you know what that's a good idea um but isn't it going to be hard to to make every piece you know you know work on a pink background and he said to me well that's the challenge you know only you can do that and I said to him you know what that's a good point and over time I've become better at working with this pink you know like um, using the right colors and right backgrounds and the right textures and it's become something that I've been I've, I've become good at and um, yeah it, it works because he he tried to give it to me in the um, example of you know if I'm driving down the road uh, he's a black cabbie by the way um, on a job and I drive past the gallery and I see pink I'm instantly gonna look twice and I said to him yeah you're right but he goes, this is the digital age now. If I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see pink, I might scroll back up because I might think, oh, is that Beverly Kills? And you know what? It worked. And it challenged me as an artist. And anything that challenges you and makes you better is good. Absolutely. And it's definitely uh, vivid and catches your eye on the timeline. So that's uh, that sounds like sage advice on his part. And, and I'm glad that you ran with it. Um, and coming back to some uh, social themes, your, a number of your pieces combine uh, images of art and war, uh, including suicide vest, art under siege, make art not war. What are you wanting to convey through those works? Um, basically, I feel like um, the machine behind war is so powerful. Imagine if we used it for the right reasons. You know, imagine if we create a, a, a machine for the positive things in the world. Like if we gave that much effort that we give into, you know, war and murder and mass homicides. Like, imagine if we did that, put that same effort and that same work into something positive, how much of an impact we can have on this world. And I know it's wishful thinking, 
of course of course it is you know you know we're never gonna we're not we're, we're never as a human race at this point in life gonna put as much effort and money into making the world a better place as we do into war i mean in america for example it's a 800 and 850 billion dollar a year machine that's how much they put into their military and it, it will cost them two billion a year to um clear up the um the homeless um homeless rate so there'll be no homeless people for two billion a year however we got 850 billion to spend on war and I don't know, but that just doesn't seem right to me. So I make these pieces not because I don't think, not because I think it's going to change the world, but it just, it's a glimpse of hope. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's nice for people to see and um, it, it, it's nice for people to agree on too because we all want that in the end of the day. And to see someone as an artist, you know, creating a piece around it for, for, for us to share and, and enjoy together, it's nice. It's reassuring. You know, it's, just, it's a beautiful thing. Definitely. That may be a, an example of, of comforting the disturbed or maybe giving voice to our, our, our silent majority out there who I think would uh, agree with you that those resources allocated to art would be uh, a far better and, and more humane uh, place to, to put them. Um, a similar uh, appearing work, Faith Under Fire, was one that you created um, fairly recently and you shared a few posts showing the evolution of the piece. Can you tell us what's involved in creating one of your works? Um, yeah, so I, I mainly work um with physical first so i'll um i'll bring a few different ideas together you know in, in writing and um i'll kind of like sometimes i'll write like a story um you know like on, on a handbook and um that story i'll take points out of it and i'll then use those points to want to, to create the subject for the piece and um with that piece you know it's like faith under fire it was like I can't remember what film I was watching, but I was watching a film and um, it was just Jesus walking with the cross, being hit with stones and hit with uh, ropes and whatnot. And um, I think it was the movie on his life and, um, you know, incredibly powerful film. And I was like, damn, man, like, how amazing would a modern version of this be? You know, not in terms of like trying to modernize the movie and the story, just um, bringing that to today's reality for us to kind of uh and digest and i thought you know what if it was in today's world i'm sure i'm sure he'd have a bulletproof vest on i'm sure he'll you know go out with a bang because you know back in those days it wasn't we didn't have the the same sort of you know rights and powers you do as you do as today and um it just became a, a fun piece while i was creating it and i thought you know, what would people like to see without, because he's one of my prophets. So I didn't want to do something where I felt like I was out of line, if that makes sense. Um, and um, at the same time, I wanted to do it. So, it, so I, knew it was, I knew it was respectful because I didn't want it to be too much around him. I wanted it to be more of a topic. And, um, and I wanted people to see it and think, yeah, you know what, man, like we, we've strayed away from, we've strayed away from our beliefs and our realities and, you know, this could be a reminder to us as, you know, remember, remember what he went through for us, you know, and maybe he could bring us closer to, um, to, to reality again, if that makes sense. And I, and I'm trying to do it in a cool way as well. So that's what that piece was about. Some of your images, this one included are, are certainly jarring and I think they are effective in, in forcing us to, to go a bit further down that road in, in grappling with some of the the social themes that you present so I, i'm i'm grateful that you're you're doing mm -hmm. that it is it, it, it's too easy to just scroll past something and sometimes when there's a really uh poignant image like this one you 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 pause for a moment and have to reflect um yeah i try, I try to have that effect on, on on people because um i'm not really a, a, a speaker uh, this is my first proper um space i've done and i've been invited to plenty um, but I knew I'd be comfortable with you. Um, so I'm not much of a speaker and I'm also uh, kind of dyslexic. And um, so when I create a piece, I, I go really a lot by, by feeling, if that makes sense. Um, and if it feels right, that's when I know it's done. So it's hard for me to try and explain sometimes, you know, the thought process and um, the ideas in, in, in terms of vocabulary, because I'm not really that type of person. Um, but 
you're making this quite easy for me, which I appreciate. Well, that's great to hear. Um, and I'm happy to hear that you were comfortable joining us today to share your thoughts because it's valuable to hear um, the voice behind these artworks. You've uh, shared some videos where you where you create street art uh, through your ex Twitter account, um, and you create real, genuine uh, uh, street art on on walls. How do you navigate the tension between the desire to create public art and the view that you're defacing buildings with graffiti, which some people still hold? Uh, well, I, I make sure I go to the right places. Um, I don't just... Because street art has come a long way in London, you know, it's, it's seen as something acceptable now. And um, so there's certain places in London where you're allowed to do it. And um, certain places where you're not allowed to do it. So it feels it feels all right. But the only tension there is, is graffiti guys don't like you painting over their work. <laughs> so you've got to be in and out as quick as possible for you find yourself in a sticky situation, which we call in London. That's so funny to hear. So finding an appropriate canvas is one of the biggest uh, challenges that you run into through street art. <laughs> for sure. Uh, w w w with the crime rate here in London right now, you know, you don't want to find yourself in any uh, bit of a predicament because it could be costly. <laughs> oh, that's funny to hear. I hadn't realized that that would be one of the main issues in creating street art in London. Um, I... I would love to hear a, a little bit more about a couple of your uh, pieces. In particular, you very effectively critiqued capitalism through your works, Toxic Society, Consumerism, and Shopping Cell is the, the most recent one I've seen of the overturned uh, shopping cart that someone's uh, imprisoned within. <laughs> yeah, that one's, a, um, I, I like that one. I, did, I really do. I, I was actually trying to think about um, printing it and uh, getting it done on a, um, getting it done on the canvas and putting it in the house because, um, that that I feel like I'm a victim of that as well, because you know, like, um, I'm a fashion guy. I love fashion. I, I, I'm a victim of that. I'm a fashion victim, and um, sometimes I find myself just buying things when I'm like, I get home and I'm like, you really pay for that? Like, you know, like, it's ridiculous. And there's people out there who are a lot worse than me because, um, I can I can afford it if that makes sense. Like I know. I know the ba I know I know the balance. Um, I won't go and spend everything I've got on a bit of fashion and whatnot. You know, big TV. I, if I don't need it, I, I won't get it. Um, but there's people out there who, because of social media, they feel like they have to they have to look good. You know, they feel like they have to keep up with the latest trends, and you know, so they become like imprisoned in in their own consumerism. So you know you don't end up having money for saving up and going on holidays and doing things that are really important and looking after yourself. But, you know, you spend everything on trying to look good for social media and, you know, that 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 doesn't leave you with anything. Um, you know, you're just you're imprisoned in your own in your own consumerism. So yeah, I I'm a, I'm a I'm a victim of that too. You know, I think we all are. But um yeah, that's 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 what I've got to say. That's it's um, heartening to hear that that you struggle with those same challenges as well. I think I think we all do, and that's probably why these types of pieces resonate with us as we we live in this consumer society, and it's nearly impossible sure, to because, escape. Exactly. If I'm making the piece, it means I'm a victim of it too. Do you know what I mean? I'm not making it because it's just based on other people and I'm perfect. No, 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 no. I'm 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 a fool as well. You know, I I I, I have Instagram. You know, I have Twitter. I have all of these things and I'm, and, and, you know, I'm an idiot too. I'm not perfect. You know, I always try to portray only the good side of things on social media. I, I never try to tell people, Oh, look, I'm going through a severe depression or I, I never share that, you know, I'm in hospital again, going through tests. You know, I, I never share that stuff because I don't want people to think that of me. Do you know what I mean? But I make these pieces because I'm, I'm a fool as well. You know, I'm going through it too. I'm not perfect. You've said that Market Makers, uh, which is a, a, a gripping piece, is one of your favorite works. What makes that yeah. piece so special to you? Okay, so for one, it's the uh, collector, um, Pablo Pancaso. He's, uh, he's been a big part of my career. You know, he's, he's changed my life a lot. And, um, you know, the fact that he collected it, you know, it meant a lot to me. You know, it, it held a dear place in my heart. And um, the piece itself is just, like I said, trying to make 
send a message where, you know, the message within that image is, you know, there's people behind the screens that can control the, the direction of the market. You know, we're, we're not in control. We're merely just, you know, uh, uh, pieces, small pieces in the, in, the, in the big machine. Now, trying to put that across into one piece, you know, kick it over complicated. You could be, you could end up doing too much. But yeah, again, somehow I figured out to make it so simple and funny at the same time, which is like, what Banksy does is simplicity yet witty, and um, I feel like I accomplished with that. And it, and the colours as well, they worked with the pink, which is what was worrying to me because I was thinking green, red. I don't know if it's going to work well with the pink, but I found the right type of vibrancy. Um, and um, the guys are climbing down, and it looks like they're just painting for the direction of the market to go up, like. They've been told to do a job by you know someone in the corporate office because you know the the it just looks I don't know it just I just love the piece it just worked out perfectly exactly how I had it in my head and when it when it works out exactly how you have it in your head as an artist you know I'm sure a couple of people can relate to this when it works out exactly how you had it in your head it's the best feeling in the world but when you got an idea and you're working on it and it's just not working the way you got it in your head. That's the most frustrating feeling in the world. But yeah, this one, yeah, it works exactly how I expected it. That's why I love it so much. It's a great piece and uh, it obviously resonates, I'm sure, with a lot of the folks in the the Web3 crypto art space uh, with the the candle that's uh, being created there. I, I love your image, though, of these. I almost viewed them as window washers who are, you know, polishing up this uh, this high rise. But also then disturbing is that idea that maybe there's someone holding them on like a bit of a puppet string in the background who is the, the true market maker, that ominous force that we never see out of sight. Exactly. And we're the window washers. <laughs> We've just been told to do a job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's a it's a wonderful piece. Thank you for uh, creating it, and kudos to uh, Pablo Pancaso for uh, for collecting your works and helping to um, support you in in growing your your career. I, I have to ask, uh, Beverly Kills is a very distinct name. What's the story behind your unique pseudonym? Um, so yeah, it was that same day that we came up with the pink. Um, I was working on a piece that had something to do with Beverly Hills. That's where the pink came from as well. If you know the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel, it's got this uh, subtle pink, uh, distinctive pink. And um, instead of naming it Beverly Hills, I, I named it Beverly Kills because the subject matter was um, how Beverly Hills, the whole lifestyle is, you know, killing people and whatever it is. I can't remember the actual image itself, but um, it came from that. And my brother, once again, was like, Beverly Kills should be your name. And honestly, I don't know where I'll be without him. And I was like, okay, cool. Are you sure? And he was like, yeah, Beverly Kills and keep the pink, you're rolling. I said to him, are you sure? He said to me, yeah. I said, okay, cool. We'll, 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 we'll roll with it. We'll make it happen. And then, um, yeah, here we are. <laughs> you know, sometimes people have the smartest answers and stuff, but with the best things, sometimes they're just the most simple answer. Like, no, yeah, that's what you're getting with me. I'm not, I haven't pl pre planned a, an amazing story for you or anything like that. I'm just giving it to you how it is. No, it's great. It's a, it's a great name. It's catchy. It's, uh, it's simple to remember. And, and that's, that's what makes it ideal. It suits the artwork as well. Um, I have to ask, mm -hmm. your art is reminiscent of Banksy, and some have criticized your work because of this. How do you respond to that, that criticism? And what impact does it have on you as an artist? I mean, you know, when it first actually happened, you know, it, it really upset me, um, like really upset me because I was thinking, it, for you to say this means you know nothing about street art. It means you know nothing about, you know, what, I, what I'm actually doing here because the people that were criticising were the ones that have said basically thought Banksy was the only street artist in the world. Like, and I'm like, there's so many people who create this type of art it, it, before Banksy's time. People who are even, you know, I'm being honest to say here, but better than Banksy. And, um, you know, so what does it mean? Does it mean because Banksy exists, no one else can create political street art? Uh, okay, so because um, uh, uh, Picasso exists, no one can create that type of art then because Picasso done it. it, it, it it's such a um, 
naive and arrogant uh, 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 points to try and make because you know you're wrong, but yet you will try your best to 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 you know take off someone's something someone's someone's incredibly proud of, worked hard for, you know. So I realized after a period of time that those critics were people who were incredibly under uh, uh, under knowledge when it came to uh, art in any in, in any in any sense because for you to think that it means you know you, you clearly know nothing about what you're talking about and I stopped letting it affect me after that point but what you do get with social media is bullies and let me tell you there is a difference between having an opinion and bullying someone on on social media and you know th- th- you know I had to deal with a bit of that for a period of time and did it did it did it did it stop me no of course not no but is it nice to deal with no it's not nice it's not nice at all thanks for sharing uh that experience in in responding to to those concerns and you're you're quite right within street art and all art uh, uh so much is uh is an evolution and uh, aspects are derivative from one era to another and so it's it's short-sightedness if people aren't aware of that what yeah. what you just finished with sounds like it, it reflects a bit of your work from the price of dissent and muted which are, are two really interesting uh commentaries on on freedom of speech and expression can you share a few thoughts on those works yeah um i feel like um as time goes by in 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 this world that we're living in freedom of speech has just become an ideology like something that we think we have something that we believe we have but the reality is we don't because if social media isn't banning you from saying something you know like if you talk about like for example i, I struggle a lot with my social uh, my, my twitter account because if i put the description of the piece uh and then tweet it twitter won't like what i'm tweeting about because anything political anything um, along those lines uh, it doesn't get pushed up in the algorithm so there you go that's one form of you know our freedom of speech being affected you know and then the second form is uh perception people's perception oh i don't want to talk about this subject because um people might not like me well then what, what are you talking about you, you have a freedom of speech you have a right to feel and think how you want fuck what other people think like you know like we're just for example with you know all this lgbtq business like we all have to you know i'm just using an example my, look my what i've got an old, I, i've got two other brothers one of them are gay i've got nothing against the lgbt uh, community but i'm just using it as an example you know this they them business if 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 i don't call you by what you want to be called then you know in canada it it is a uh, it's a crime you can go to jail for it but how is that how wh- where have we got to with society if I can't think and feel how I want. It, 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 it's, it's an illegal crime for me to do that. And if I tweet about it, no one's going to see it because the algorithm doesn't like it. Or tons of people might not agree with it and get me blocked. Or, you know, worse, uh, cancelled. Look at the cancel culture we're dealing with today. Can you believe that? There's a, there's a thing called cancel culture. We could have never seen this coming. You know, this is, this is you know, all these social media apps and stuff, this is meant to be for our benefit. It's meant to be for our power. But it's really not if you can get cancelled tomorrow for saying what you what you believe. It's interesting because your your art, to some degree, is a bit of a Trojan horse that can sneak some of your your messages through. Because I think the the visual content passes the algorithm more easily than the the text based content. So you are still able to subvert a bit of that through a. Uh, through these words i love the I, I pinned here the muted one which is the the twitter bird with uh i think some some tape around the beak which is really effective that's a, a great piece i'd love to turn with our time remaining to a couple questions on collecting um you've talked quite a bit about uh about your your brother's artwork and i'm not sure how much that spills over into your own what types of art do you collect and and is there a theme to your own collection yeah um i collect a lot of um modern art um so I do a lot of street art. Um, I've got Banksy. Um, I've got uh, Mr. Brainwash. And then um, I'll spill over into contemporary art as well. So there's an artist that I really like right now. Um, I'm actually outside the gallery where I picked up her first piece. Um, I'm trying to remember her name. She's a new artist. She's a young girl. And she's been she's been in um, a few different 
you know, amazing galleries and she's she's on her way up. Uh, I can't remember her name off the top of my head right now because, um, yeah, the medication that I'm on makes me look quite forgetful of things. But um, she does um, she does contemporary art and, um, you know, the simple uh, strokes of, paint, of paintbrushes over a, a, a blank canvas. And, um, yeah, and then I'll go into, like, this new age art, which is, like, I got, like, um, a piece in my house, which is, you know, those uh, fire, um, you know, break glass in, a, in case of emergency. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those where it's quite big and it's got a hundred dollar bill rolled up and uh, a packet of cocaine next to it. <laughs> and I got that in the bathroom and it's just, so m- m- I collect all different types of art, um, whether it's contemporary, modern or street art. If I like it, then I, I just I just collect it. And that's what my brother taught me because a lot of people go into it where they're looking for something that's going to appreciate in value and this and that. But um, the, the biggest thing I learned from him is buy what you like because that's what happened with the Banksy's. He just, Banksy was a nobody and Kerry, my, my brother loved his art and he just bought it. And now, you know, you know, they've sorted him out for the rest of his life. So if you just buy what you like, you know, that that's the main rule. So I don't go into galleries saying, you know, what artist is on their way up and who's doing well and who's been here and who's been there. If I like it, I'll buy it. And that's it. That's a great approach. Is there a piece in your collection that has a, a unique significance or is particularly meaningful to you? Uh, yeah, um, I got a Banksy. Um, so the one that I'm talking about now is the... Um, it's a ten pound notes. It's two ten pound notes uh, in one piece, and um, it's got Princess Diana Diana on it instead of the Queen. And um, I love Princess Diana. You know, like what she stood for and who she was as an individual, and what she brought to the world. Um, you know, like people like that. If we had a few more people like that in the world, man, you know, this place would be a better place. And um, it, it it means a lot more to me as well because my brother gave it to me after. You know, the my career kind of started working out in NFTs. You know, he said, I'm really proud of you. And he gifted it to me. And um, that was my first Banksy. And of course, you know, knowing you, you knowing me, you can imagine what that meant to me. Um, but yeah, that's your answer. That's a, a great piece. And uh, thanks for sharing the background to it. Does does the art that you collect influence the, the type of artwork you create or, or vice versa? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, actually, uh, the art I collect doesn't, but the artists do. Um, for example, Mr. Brainwash, I've been infatuated with him recently. He's like a he's like a um, new, younger, modern Banksy because we don't know how old Banksy is or who he is, but we know who Brainwash is, and he kind of brings Banksy Banksy's artworks, his actual pieces that he's done, and he collaborates them with his own funky style and it's like it creates this in 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 my eyes in my mind this new banksy like uh it's like when they got the uh bored apes and then the mutant you know the mutant types so it just it, it felt like that to me and you know i was and, and he got banksy's approval like not that he needed it but um after a few years of him doing it banksy actually um gave him the approval was like yeah i'm actually you know happy for you and that's a beautiful thing to see artists, uh, you know, go through an experience together. And to see that happen gives me hope one day, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I have a question around your, your collectors. You mentioned uh, Pablo Pancaso um, already with the, the Market Makers piece. What kinds of things do you do to create meaningful connections with those who collect your art? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, because things on social media are a bit different than they are in real life. Um, I try not to bother people too much, to be honest with you, because, uh, like, for example, uh, Pancaso, he, he, he's become a friend because um, he really loves my art. So he, he would keep in touch with me, if that makes sense. And I'll do my best to keep in touch with him. So, like, I don't call him a, a, a collector. I don't really call any of them collectors. And I, You probably hear this a lot, and it's corny, but they're like friends. And I like it like that because I've got you know people who collect my art and they ask me about my health you know and i ask them about their kids and 
we 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 know everything about each other. You know, we got each other's numbers. We're on Telegram with each other. Like it's it's pretty cool. It's just it's nicer that way. But when you think of people as collectors, and it's it's so unorganic. Like you're gonna go and you're just gonna DM them, hey, how are you? Just checking in. It's it doesn't seem very genuine. But if you naturally form a relationship like that with one of them, then yeah, of course it's nice to check in on them and then them checking in on you and it, yeah, it's nice because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make friends, you know. Um, it would be nice to eventually meet meet more of my collectors. I've met I've met a couple of them here in London and I've taken them around West London where I've grown up and shown them some of the galleries I grew up around as well and you know some of the street art in the area that I grew up around and yeah, like we form you know meaningful relationships. I, I love to hear that. It's 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 not a transactional exchange, but there's meaning and, and the personal touch behind those who you've gotten close to through your art. Beverly Kills, you've been very generous with your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us on any topic, art or, or otherwise? Not really, man. I just want to say, you know, thank you for having me. Um, like I've said, I've never done this before. Uh, I've always avoided it. And um the only reason why I felt comfortable with this because, you know, I, I know of you guys and um, you you guys are extremely humble and you bring nothing but, you know, something different to the game. And, and I like that. And I knew I would be able to connect with you. Beverly Kills, your art invites us to reconsider our behaviours as consumers and as citizens. And it asks us to examine the, the purpose and value of art in society, which is, is really critical to experiencing the world today. Thank you so much for joining us to share your story. Listen, thank you for having me. I really genuinely appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to join us at our next collector's call.